1946, after World War II, the US Navy launched the largest expedition to Antarctica to date. Titled Operation High Jump, the mission was led by Admiral Richard E. Byrd. The official narrative of the mission's objectives were to establish a US military and scientific research bases on the continent of Antarctica. Although Admiral Byrd's previous missions to Antarctica before the war gained him notoriety, they primarily failed due to the harsh conditions. Operation High Jump proved just as treacherous, with some of the crew perishing in blizzards and plane crashes and resulted in early termination. Operation High Jump included a staggering 13 ships, aircraft escort, aircraft carrier, a submarine, two destroyers and a total of 4,700 men with full battle gear in what was officially called an ordinary training exercise and attempt to establish research bases. Speaking about the operation, Bird said that the most important result of his observations and discoveries is the potential effect that they have in relation to the security of the United States. The fantastic speed with which the world is shrinking, recalled the Admiral, is one of the most important lessons learned during the recent Antarctic exploration. I have to warn my compatriots that the time has ended when we were able to take refuge in our isolation and rely on the certainty that the distances, the oceans and the poles were a guarantee of safety. He also said he didn't want to frighten anyone on Julie, but that it was a bitter reality that in the case of a new war, the continental United States would be attacked by flying objects which could fly from pole to pole at incredible speeds. Many have since theorized that the specific security risk relates to the numerous alleged covert operations that took place during the Nazi era, the most memorable being that of New Swabia and the mysterious Base 211 located within Antarctica. These theories suggest that Byrd and his crew were actually searching for these secret Nazi bases that have been rumored to be impenetrable. There are rumors and speculations that the Nazis had developed a type of aircraft with anti-gravity, specifically the type we now associate with flying saucers, and were able to not only just leave the planet and journey into space, but also launch very powerful attacks on any challengers. Interestingly, in July 1947, just five months after Byrd's Operation High Jump was terminated in Antarctica, the infamous Roswell crash happened. The official narrative states that a balloon crashed into a ranch in Roswell, New Mexico, but since the incident, a growing body of theories have arisen that suggest that what actually crashed in Roswell was a UFO. Between 1978 and the early 1990s, documents were obtained via Freedom of Information Act requests which fueled these theories, suggesting a UFO had crashed at Roswell and alien bodies and technology had been recovered by the US military. A plethora of books have been written on the subject, Interestingly, soon after the crash in 1947, the Central Intelligence Agency, the Department of Defense and the National Security Agency were all established. Just as the space race between America and Russia began in 1956, Admiral Byrd returned to Antarctica under Operation Deep Freeze to once again attempt to establish US Antarctic bases. It marked the beginning of a permanent military presence in Antarctica. Speaking about Antarctica, Bird said, Admiral Bird, you've been to both the North Pole and the South Pole. Is there any unexplored land left on this earth that might appeal to adventurous young Americans? Uh, yes, there is. And not up around the North Pole because it's getting crowded up there now because they find out it's really usable, not only to live in, but militarily. But strangely enough, there's left in the world today an area as big as the United States that's never been seen by a human being. And that's beyond the pole on the other side of the South Pole from Middle America. And it's, uh, I think it's quite astonishing that there should be an area as big as that unexplored. That's a tremendous So challenge. there's a lot of adventure left down at the bottom of the world. Admiral Byrd died in his sleep of a heart ailment a year later in 1957. He was an active Freemason. A year later, in 1958, NASA was established, 
And then soon after, in 1959, the Antarctica Treaty was signed by the UN, prohibiting access and ownership. I do not dispute that the Nazis created advanced technological flying crafts, and I do not dispute that many of them could have potentially fled to deep Antarctic bases. What many are not taught in history lessons at school is that many Nazis actually fled to America after the war. Remember, all wars are carefully choreographed by the satanic Illuminati elite. They are illusions cast upon the people using a system of us versus them, when in reality the us is funding the them and vice versa. Werner von Braun was a German-born aerospace engineer and so-called space architect and worked on Nazi Germany's rocket development program. In 1960, him and others were hired by NASA, where he served as director of the newly formed Marshall Space Flight Center. He was also chief architect of the technology that supposedly landed the Apollo spacecraft on the moon. What many haven't realized is that the Roswell crash and UFO narrative of 1947 was a carefully wrought and insidious form of false flag that can be classified as a PSYOP. A PSYOP is a psychological operation designed specifically to convey selected information and indicators to audiences to influence their emotions, motive and objective reasoning. PSYOPs plant ideas in people's minds in a covert way. And what better way to create intrigue and hype for the upcoming space race of the 50s than to leave crumbs of information suggesting alien life? PSYOPs are highly manipulative and can work in a reverse psychological manner in which the recipient feels that the information must be true because it was secret. The Freedom of Information Act releases worked on a big portion of the public in just this manner. They appeared secret with just enough deliberately planted UFO and alien references to provoke an intended response in their audience. Other very famous leaked government documents such as Majestic 12 work in the same way. Just because something leaks does not mean it is true. Leaks can be plotted to influence and manipulate. And it makes getting to the truth really tough business. If a government has top secret information, mitigation procedures make it very difficult to leak. And that's why any leaks that do make it out require high skepticism and proof by evidence. The Pizzagate emails actually tell us minimal, but the real life evidence and prevalence of such evidence validates them. Leaked UFO alien disclosure works the opposite way. We have next to no evidence of this existing other than the so-called secret information suggesting its existence. Governments, the media and Hollywood do not explore satanic child sacrifice. In fact, they act very fast to censor it quickly. But they do love to entertain the alien agenda whenever they get a chance. You see, there is a secret. And it's a secret that they do not want us to know. It is one of the greatest secrets of all time. And Roswell, Nazi UFOs, NASA, the space race and the moon landings were all carefully designed to cover it up. You see, as the space race was heavily underway, there was another military operation taking place. Before we turn our attention to the specifics of this operation, it is necessary to take a look at another US Navy leader, James Van Allen. During the same time period between 1946 and 1954 that Admiral Byrd was exploring the North and South Poles, so was Van Allen. The satanic scientist Kabbalah priests tell us that he was conducting experiments to discover more about the Earth's magnetism or magnetosphere. Van Allen had developed this bizarre invention called a raccoon a balloon rocket combination that lifted missile rockets on balloons high above the Earth's atmosphere before firing them even higher. And he was conducting these experiments at the Arctic and Antarctic regions. What he discovered was, of course, named the Van Allen Belts. NASA tells us that the belts are barriers of seething radiation that surround the Earth and a collection of charged particles gathered in place by Earth's magnetic field. 
The belts extend from the starting altitude of 640 kilometers all the way to 58,000 kilometers. According to science, the belts begin at 640 kilometers or what is referred to as just above low Earth orbit. And this is where it gets tricky for NASA and the governments of the world. Listen to what they say. As we get further away from Earth, we'll pass through the Van Allen belts, an area of dangerous radiation. But Orion has protection. Shielding will be put to the test as the vehicle cuts through the waves of radiation. Sensors aboard will record radiation levels for scientists to study. We must solve these challenges before we send people through this region of space. And unlike the previous program, we are setting a course with specific and achievable milestones. Early in the next decade, a set of crewed flights will test and prove the systems required for exploration beyond low Earth orbit, beyond low Earth orbit, beyond low Earth orbit. The kinds of technologies that we're testing out on Space Station are definitely helping us with our goals of going beyond low Earth orbit. So we have a really robust exploration program at NASA. The plan that NASA has is to build a rocket called SLS, which is a heavy lift rocket. It's something that is, that is much bigger than what we have today and it will be able to launch the Orion capsule with humans on board, as well as uh, landers or other uh, components to, via, to destinations beyond Earth orbit. Right now, we only can fly in Earth orbit. That's the farthest that we can go. And this new system that we're building is gonna allow us to go beyond and hopefully take humans into the solar system to explore. So the moon, Mars, asteroids, there's a lot of destinations that we could go to, and we're building these building block components in order to allow us to do that eventually. The moon, Mars, asteroids, there's a lot of destinations that we could go to. The moon, Mars, asteroids, there's a lot of destinations that we could go to. The moon, the moon, the moon. Wait, what? Come again? I thought we went to the moon. Hmm, it seems like someone is lying. And now that you know about these radiation belts, do you really believe we went to this imaginary ball of rock in this tin can? We never went to the moon, and no one can go to the moon as it is not a sphere. Van Allen was approached by the military in the early 60s. In 1962, he suggested clearing the belts away by setting off nuclear bombs near the outer belt. The US military contacted Van Allen and began conducting a series of nuclear tests in the early 1960s called Operation Dominic. As the official narrative tells us, the operation included within it the Operation Fishbowl events, which were designed to understand how nuclear weapons would interact with the Earth's so-called magnetic field. The highest of the fishbowl events was called Starfish Prime, a 1.4 megaton nuclear bomb detonated at 400 kilometers on July 9th, 1962. Why were they firing rockets and nuclear bombs way up into the Earth's atmosphere to discover more about its radiation? You do realize that nuclear bombs produce extreme radiation. You do not discover the chemical composition of lemon juice by squeezing more lemon juice onto it. And this is a secret. No one in history has ever left Earth. You cannot leave Earth. They are telling you to your face. Now, one thing I really want your generation to embrace is that the Earth is a closed system. The Earth is a closed system. We cannot leave the Earth. There's no place to go. And this is from one of the highest satanic scientist Kabbalah priests himself. Straight from the goat's mouth. See, the satanists just have to tell you, they are hiding it in plain sight again. And they're getting away with it because they are relying on both our inability to get our heads around the bamboozlement of impossible figures and phenomena, and they are also relying on our blind trust in the scientific institutions of the world and their word. No one has ever left flat earth. It is a closed system and not because there are radiation belts. No one has left because there is a dome like roof above of what is better understood as a firmament. We cannot leave the earth. 
This is what Admiral Byrd discovered in Antarctica. They discovered the foundations of the firmament. And that's why you cannot go to Antarctica. It is literally the edge of the earth. And I know what you're probably thinking. What? This is going from crazy to crazier to insane. But by now you already know what I am going to say. Let me show you. In 2014, civilian space geeks constructed their own rocket with a camera on and sent it up with the goal of being the first civilian rocket to make it to space. Look what happens. Our mission as the civilian space exploration team is to be the first civilian team in history to launch a rocket that reaches space. All systems are go for launch. You might have 10 seconds. 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. What did that rocket hit? If there was a high amount of intense radiation up there, it would have scorched that mini rocket to pieces. There is no radiation above us, covering a globular spinning planet ball. It is a flat, stationary plane with a firmament above. And I know that you want to scream and say that does not prove anything. The rocket's engine could have failed. But take it easy. We are just getting started. You see, what they never told you in school is that every single civilization in our Earth's history knew that the Earth is flat and there existed a firmament above our heads. They were trying to tell us and illustrations throughout the years have brought their conceptions of the world that we live in to life. Look. Only one is the satanic lie. Take another look at NASA's insignia. Did you not notice? Look at the ring around the planet, Saturn. And look closer at what they call the red chevron. Don't you think it looks like a split tongue? The tongue of the serpent? It almost resembles the letter T, which would give the organization's name an interesting anagram. But just a coincidence, I'm sure. And why does every single rocket that NASA supposedly sends up to space take the exact same path? Look, they aren't sending rockets into space. 
They reach a certain altitude and begin bending until traveling horizontally and landed in the ocean somewhere. They cannot go up and leave Earth's atmosphere and journey into space because there is no space. There is a firmament above. And they have been hiding it in plain sight the whole time. Look closer at the Masonic drawings. Can you see it? The four pillars or the four corners of the earth, the sun and moon the same size and both within an arched dome or firmament. And of course satanic pedo Hollywood has already told us while laughing behind our backs, look. And the more they brainwash us with movies about space, fake rocket launches and bamboozlement science, we are forgetting more and more that our ancient historical texts reference the firmament. The Book of Enoch, a non-canonical biblical text that was discovered as part of the Dead Sea Scrolls, reads, And I saw the cornerstone of the earth, and I saw the four winds which support the earth, and the sky, and I saw the winds which turn the sky and cause the disk of the sun and all the stars to set. And I saw the winds of the earth which support the clouds, and I saw the paths of the angels. I saw at the end of the earth the firmament of heaven above. The Quran references it. With power and skill did we construct the firmament. The book of Job, which is older than the Torah itself, references this very firmament. Hast thou with him spread out the sky, which is strong as a molten looking glass? What does that mean, a molten looking glass? 
I guess I'm up against the highest, hardest stained glass ceiling. <laughs> so, I guess I'm up against the highest, hardest stained glass ceiling. but we are all standing under a glass ceiling right now. Yeah. It was fine for all this talk about me running to break the big, hard glass ceiling. And Although we weren't able to shatter that highest, hardest glass ceiling this time, thanks to you, it's got about 18 million cracks in it. is shining through like never before. There's a mystery. Scattered around in the sand are thousands of chunks of strange yellow-green glass. It is really, really a mysterious glass. We scientists are still kind of puzzled how these things form. And I can't believe we just put the biggest crack in that glass ceiling yet. It's got about 18 million cracks in it. Again, they are telling us. And the crowd claps and cheers in their own ignorance. They are telling us while laughing behind our backs. But wait a minute. The firmament cannot be made of super strong glass or that rocket would have been shattered upon impact. And I know, I know, I know. Maybe the rocket just malfunctioned or ran out of power. Stay with me. Interestingly, the biblical book of Genesis holds some clues to this mystery. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. Could there really be water just above the firmament and directly below it? It sounds like an absurd concept. Not as absurd as bending oceans wrapped around a spinning space ball, mind you. So let's investigate. It's the stars and the planets themselves that offer more clues. In case you forgot, the planets that NASA and other official space agencies show us are CGI or artistic renditions. We have seen their lazy Photoshop skills exposed in previous episodes. We see something very different when we use an advanced and powerful lens like found on Nikon cameras and look at the planets above us. Look.
They are pulsing and shifting, almost dancing. NASA says this is because of the Earth's atmosphere, but as we just saw, not all of them follow the same pattern. Each planet here radiates its own specific patterns and light movements. You see, what we call the planets are actually stars like the rest of the stars we see at night. And the sun is a sun, not a star. This is a star. And this is a sun.
There is no space. No Kabbalah iron soft vacuum of nothingness. Space is an elaborate hoax. Real space is water. And the water below the firmament appears to be some kind of gooey substance that is paradoxically soft and yet impenetrable. They cannot get through it. And it seems that one scientist found a similar kind of substance within the dark depths of the ocean. One of the strangest places on the ocean's floor was only just discovered in the 1990s. And my degree is one of a handful of people to ever see it in person. Without a doubt, one of the most amazing things that I had ever seen in the bottom of the ocean, it was while filming for Blue Planet, it was in the Gulf of Mexico. And I noticed there's something out in the distance, couldn't tell exactly what, but it looked like a dark band. And as we approached it, the dark band became a donut. I saw this donut that was black in the center. What the heck is that? And so as we get closer and closer to it, I noticed that the black band had what appeared to be kind of steam over it. And then I looked and there was water lapping against the shoreline. This band was a ring of muscles. And inside the ring of muscles was a lake. And it's like, wait a minute, I'm already underwater. We went out over the water in this lake and tried to descend it and bounced off. It was so super saline and dense that the submarine couldn't go down it. We literally bounced off. And as we bounced off, we sent ripples heading back to the shoreline. It was insane. I've never NASA tells us that our globe is spinning at a thousand miles per hour on its axes and 67,000 miles per hour around the sun, which is then traveling at 570,000 miles per hour within our galaxy. If this was truly the case, then we would not see the same constellations in the same places in the night sky. The night sky would be completely random and perpetually changing, but it isn't. As we've seen, the stars above us, attached somehow to a great, immense and mysterious firmament, travel in circular motions around our flat, stationary Earth with Polaris, or what we call the Northern Star, a fixed unmoving point in the centre and above the centre of our Earth at the North Pole. We've been told that comets are huge ice particles that, when passing within the distance of our Sun, begin to melt which causes them to release gas and create a trail and tail. They tell us that comets can travel a hundred thousand miles an hour. But they are lying again. Here is time-lapse footage of the recent comet Neowise. As you can see, the comet is not actually moving in its own path. It is fixed in its area on the firmament and moving in conjunction with the rest of the stars. There is no travelling comet journeying at 100,000 miles per hour. But look closer. Can you not see it? It is a large opening in the firmament, casting a ray of light from whatever exists behind and through the water beneath it. Much like you see with the light entering in an underwater cave opening deep in the ocean. There's a very simple experiment that you can do in the comfort of your own home to prove the existence of the firmament or earthly dome. Create a rainbow. National Geographic tells us that a rainbow is a multicolored arc made by light striking water droplets. The most familiar type rainbow is produced when sunlight strikes raindrops in front of a viewer at a precise angle. Rainbows can also be viewed around fog, sea spray or waterfalls. A rainbow is an optical illusion. It does not actually exist in a specific spot in the sky. The appearance of a rainbow depends on where you are standing and where the sun or other source of light is shining. They go on to state that rainbows are the result of the refraction and reflection of light. Both refraction and reflection are phenomena that involve a change in a wave's direction. 
a refracted wave may appear bent while a reflected wave may seem to bounce back from a surface or other wave front light entering a water droplet is refracted it is then reflected by the back of the droplet as this reflected light leaves the droplet it is refracted again at multiple angles refraction is the bending of light it also happens with sound water and other waves as it passes from one transparent medium such as glass into another here we see the white light hitting the glass triangular prism and refracting the light into a straight rainbow we have never seen a straight rainbow a triangular rainbow or one that forms right angles or goes up and down or left to right in order for refraction to take place, the white light has to reflect through a prism, which has to be transparent like glass. So whatever the white light of the sun is hitting when we see a rainbow, it has to be the shape of the prism it is hitting. The rainbow is always there, but there needs to be a screen for us to see it. The rainbow is always there, but we only see it when the rain forms a condensed mist, like a screen. That's why we see smaller rainbows in garden sprinklers. And it's important to note that the rainbows we see in garden sprinklers retain the same shape as the ones we see in the sky. The screen mist of water provides us a screen to see the refracted light of the rainbow which holds its prism shape, i.e. a glass dome. It's really that simple. In the same way the laws of density and perspective are really that simple. But here's where it gets unbelievable. Look at this image of a rainbow reflected in the ocean. Notice how the colors are reflected, like in a mirror, so the colors are reversed. The violet, indigo and blue that are always at the bottom of the rainbow are here at the top of the rainbow in the reflection. Now try this for yourself at home. ScienceSparks.com tells us how we can make a rainbow. You can either make a rainbow with a mirror. Try placing a mirror inside a glass and angling the glass so sunlight hits the mirror. You should be able to reflect a rainbow onto a wall. Or you can do the same exercise, but instead of using sunlight, you can shine a torch. The rainbow that is reflected from the flat mirror, i.e. the prism, and the screen of water, like when it rains or there is water mist, creates a near straight rainbow onto the wall. If water is the reason for creating the arch rainbow shape, as science says, then why does it here produce a straight rainbow? Now take a dome circular glass as your prism and fill it with water and let the white light of the sun shine through it. You get an arched rainbow because the prism has a dome-like shape. And it's just like the rainbow we see here on Earth. There is a double rainbow here. But unlike the double rainbow we see reflected in the ocean, the colors here are not reverse. Now look. Can you see it? The colors in the top rainbow are reversed. What you are seeing is a reflection of the rainbow in the glass firmament above, just like you would in a mirror and just like we see over the ocean or a lake. How dare they lie to us? And now really think about it. Why would a satanic Illuminati network of individuals who have all the money, power and control in the world and who molest, rape, torture, murder, drink the blood of children and worship Lucifer want to hide that our earth is flat and that there is a firmament above and the sun and the moon are local and within our dome? Why hide the true nature of our earth from us? Well, if they worship something immaterial, they call Lucifer and convince everyone that is not in their little cult that they are the product of a nothingness that randomly produced a small speck which then randomly expanded and created matter and life, then you remove all possibility in the person's mind that their life is anything more than a random coincidence. However, if the Earth is a closed system with a firmament above, then it really requires serious speculation and consideration as to how our ancient ancestors and various ancient and biblical texts knew this.
The Illuminati cabal do not want us to seriously consider the notion of creation, purpose for human existence, the existence of good and evil as real energetic entities rather than archaic words to describe something that their fraudulent sciences call the spectrum of mental health. The satanic Illuminati power complex cast humanity into the dark and kept the knowledge for themselves. Again, they worship something immaterial, which they call Lucifer, and sacrifice children to whatever this thing is, and all the while control every aspect of knowledge we receive. We go about our days with heads down glued to our smartphones, downloading their programs and information that keep us brainwashed when our eyes should be looking up to our firmament and the stars attached within it. But wait, there's more to the story. As we saw, they called the nuclear missile events of the 1960s Operation Fishbowl, and this operation was part of a larger one, Operation Dominic. The name Dominic comes from the Latin Dominicus, which means of the Lord. So together we get Fishbowl of the Lord. Again, it's there hiding in plain sight. The actions committed against children are the greatest of all sins and crimes, but this comes very close. There is nothing more satanic and evil than hiding the true nature of what humanity really is and what exists beyond. Could there be a God? I don't know. The biblical texts, which hold many truths and clues, have been tampered with by the satanic body of elites. The Bible used to contain over 80 books, but some were removed and hidden. It now contains 66 books. 66. That number again. Something I did not want to show you until this point in the series are the true mathematical calculations of the Masonic science of the heliocentric Earth. We are told it spins on an axis of 23.4 degrees. If a straight angle is 90 degrees, and we subtract the 23.4 degrees of the Earth's tilt, what number are we left with? 66.6. .6. I have told you that the Earth orbits the Sun at 67,000 miles per hour, but you see I round it up. Wikipedia gives us a true Masonic figure, 66,600 miles per hour. I have also shown how according to the heliocentric model the Earth should curve at 8 inches per mile squared. What is 8 inches in feet? At this point you already know. It's 0.666. And look at what latitude they tell us that the Arctic and Antarctic poles are located at. 66.6 latitude. Can you see what is happening? How many coincidences before mathematically impossible? They are lying to us. There are no coincidences. Coincidence and randomness is Kabbalah science. I have saved this until now because I wanted to show you first. Buried deep within hundreds of pages of declassified CIA documents that present abstracts or cover notes of Soviet scientific studies, there are a couple of cards from the 1940s and 60s that are very telling. Here is an abstract outlining a study they were conducting on photographing the firmament. The full studies are not accessible to the public, but we can see here that they have produced a camera that can take a photograph of the firmament in its entirety all the way down to the horizon. Another abstract details echoes and glows in the firmament, and another measuring the colour temperature of the firmament. In another abstract there is a contents page for naval personnel. Look at the contents. The shape of the firmament. Rings around the sun and distortion of the sun's and moon's disks at the horizon. Discs, not spheres, just like reference in the Book of Enoch. Again, it is just an abstract of the manual and we cannot see the full contents. In another abstract we see reference to what they call the Eros firmament. It states that at the Eros firmament, the passage of the sun is five times quicker. The passage of the sun, 
They do not reference the Earth's spinning orbit, but that the Sun is the one moving and making a passage over the Earth right below the firmament. Notice the dates, which align with all the operations at the poles and firing missiles up into our sky. The reference to a firmament is scarce and almost unnoticeable in the hundreds of pages that were declassified, but it is there. And there is a huge difference between these declassified documents and the government leaks I spoke about earlier, like that of Majestic 12. Barely anyone has ever noticed these snippets of study abstracts. I would say that it was by negligence that these references were even declassified within hundreds of other pages of unrelated material in the first place. But I don't think it's that. It's complacency. No one is ever likely to come across these buried documents, and if they did, I doubt they would think twice after skimming over a study title referencing the firmament. The space heliocentric hoax has been so ingrained in our minds from our early years and reinforced on a daily basis in ways we don't even think twice about, it would never occur to us the significance of such references in documents of the 1940s and 60s. But it is there, hidden in plain sight. Even the Simpsons have told us. Santa Claus kicks and deals. It's a long fly ball going back, back. <laughs> And the ball shatters the sky, bringing the ocean itself down into the stadium. Oh, and you remember Nazi aerospace engineer Werner von Braun, who was a leading director at NASA upon its founding and a leading figure in the Apollo moon missions? Well, he died in 1977. Look at his grave. It references Psalms 19.1. What is that verse? The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. You see, it's always been there waiting for us to notice. We just fell asleep as children to bedtime stories of space explorers and never woke up. Space is a highly manipulative and controlled psyop, an elaborate hoax to control us and destabilize us from our true human nature. It is the greatest lie of all time. And I know what you're thinking. If space is fake, does this eradicate the possibility of alien life? I can almost feel the disappointment in you. Just like all those years ago when you discovered Santa was not real. But no, it doesn't mean there isn't other life. And I implore you to consider the potential vastness of a new kind of space and land beyond the poles that Admiral Byrd was referring to. Again, it's been right in your face the whole time. ETs, extraterrestrial, aka extra territory. Don't worry, I am not going to ruin the excitement your imagination feels when it thinks of extraterrestrials. In fact, I'm going to enhance it. But before I do that, however, we need to examine more of our flat stationary plane that is bound by the wonder of our firmament and the waters above. We still have time, and I need to make an important stop first. Come on, move swiftly. Follow me to part 9, I need to show you the panic they are in now their little secret is starting to emerge.